My name is uh, Eugene Vasquez. I go by either Gene or most of my friends call me Gino. I was born in Texas, the city of Fort Worth, in 1946, and I lived there till uh, I graduated and came out to California in uh, 1965. And I moved in with my uh, my sister and her husband and her uh, four kids. My brother-in-law joined the Marines when at 17, but he was a Korean veteran and he uh, stayed in the reserves. And when the war broke out in Vietnam, he uh, volunteered because he wanted to go to Vietnam. So I got the uh, idea of joining the Marines if I ever was to go into service. And he left for Vietnam, I, I would say around September, October. And no later than two months after that, uh, December, I got drafted. My draft notices was to go to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. And Army, I did not want to go. So I said, well, I wanted, to stay, I wanted to stay in California. So I went and saw a recruiter. I said, well, the only way you can go back to California if you join the Marines. I said, well, go ahead. I'll join the Marines. And so, so I did, and I joined the Marines. And I, uh, people back home were saying, are you crazy? I said, why? I, at the time, I was naive. You know, you're young, you're 19 years old. And I guess by me doing what I did, I was doing my thing. And I'm not thinking about the war or anything. When I went to boot camp, uh, it was the, the first thing that anybody remembers of the yellow footprints, of course. Uh, it's, that's right. You'll never forget those. Then the platoon leader comes in, I mean, drill instructors, I'll say, after the all the orientation is get your clothes here, get this and this. And then they come in and they introduce themselves, who they are. And I remember Sergeant Bolton coming up and saying, he was a quiet person, didn't say too much. It just, but how he said it, uh, it just enough to to uh, scare you. Because like I say, you're, you're 20, 21 years old and you don't know what the hell's going on because they're already starting to beat on you already. And he gets up there and he says he is the platoon sergeant, that his name is Sergeant Bolton, that he will be the uh, platoon sergeant, that he will be in charge of what what goes on when he tells the drill instructors what has to be done. And the only main concern with Bolton was, whatever you do, don't lose that ribbon on the, on the uh, grinder that march. But that was his, his thing. The ribbon is, 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 is you compete against four other platoons, three other platoons, to so see who marches the cadence better than you. And Bolton had a, a streak going where I think he's gotten one at a couple of times in a row with the last two platoons that he had. And and that was his main goal. And we lost. And he wasn't too happy. And uh, I forgot what what punishment we received for, for not winning the uh, the ribbon for the march. And then when it came time to, uh, everybody was getting their orders to see where they were going and he was reading out the orders and uh, I remember saying Vasquez 0311 and so I, I knew where the 0311 was I said shit that's uh, infantry I said I know where I'm going now I said I don't have to think about it because this is what I expected Well, after uh, boot camp, and right off the bat, I said, I know where I'm going now for sure. And so I went to uh, advanced training, infantry training for six weeks. And when it came time to, de to deploy to Vietnam, that weekend, I said, well, this is my last weekend here. I'm going to settle, or let's go celebrate to some of the guys. So we got wasted. We drank. Yeah, you know, it's gonna be, it might be our last beer here. So we were pulling around in the barracks, and I you know, we were shadow boxing, and I grabbed this one marine by the by the back of the neck, and he flipped me, and I dislocated my shoulder. So that set me back. I, I wasn't able to 
to go to Vietnam at, at that time in June 66. I had two operations on my shoulder and that set me back till the following year in 67. And then the time came to uh, go to Vietnam and that was around uh, March of uh, 67. And here I am in, in Vietnam and scared, yes. I mean, I mean, you're in a different country and the, the elements is war and, and you gotta, you ask for it, you got it. We, land, we landed in, in Da Nang and they told me that we'll be going with uh, a company, my company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. They just gotten back from uh, Chulai, and, which was uh, south of uh, Da Nang. And I, and I remember them saying that I was going to be in a platoon, what platoon I was going to be in, and that they were going to be going to a hill, 52. But we were set on a hill, the mountains to the right and the river to the left. And we were sitting ducks on that hill. I mean, we could, they could have murdered us any time they wanted to, really. Now, this hill was just a hill. Nothing was there. They told us we were going to have to build bunkers, build uh, trenches, and what have you. And uh, I remember doing all that. Much to my surprise, when I got to... Uh, Vietnam, I was told that uh, Hill 25 was down the road and there was uh, a platoon sergeant that used to be a drill instructor was in charge of the Hill 25. And I asked, uh, who was the drill instructor? And they said, his name is Sergeant Bolton. And I said, oh shit, that's my drill instructor. I said, what are the chances of, of me meeting up with my drill instructor in the, in Vietnam, a million to one. And sure enough that there he was and, uh, but he was a changed man because what, what he did in boot camp did not do anything, had to do with being in Vietnam. It was a whole different, different world with, uh, me being up there with him and, uh, I got to really respect the man more, more so than I did in boot camp. In boot camp, you hate your DIs, but what, you know they, they do things uh, they're not supposed to. But that's part of uh, the training. And if if you call your congressman or your mom or your what have you, they're gonna call you all kinds of names, and they're gonna come down on you, and you're not gonna be trusted. We thought that's what they say, and. I, I really got to respect uh, Sergeant Bowden. I had been in the country uh, probably about a month now, and I saw my first casualty. The point man walked, uh, he was about, I was back at the point man, and the Marine was behind me, and uh, and the point man walked over it and I walked over it and then the Marine behind me stepped on the mine and that was my first casualty. We had to go and pick up the remains and I was scared. I mean, I'm not going to admit that I wasn't, but I was, you know, because it's, it's something that you don't see every day, you know, picking up parts from the, from the, off the ground. Well, I was in Vietnam. My uh, my assignment when I first got there was to learn how to lead, or not to lead, but uh, walk patrols and get uh, be aware of your surroundings all the time. And when my time came was to be a point man. That's 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 one of the scariest parts is being the point man, because you're green, you're new in the country, and you everybody takes their turn to be a point man. Everybody else been through it, and it's your turn now. It's it's like a rotation, and so I became the point man, and but then somebody else came into the platoon and they 
it was their turn or his turn to be the point man. And God be behold, nobody wanted to be a point man because sometimes these mine sweepers go up in front of us and they might miss the mine. And who knows, they might you might step on it or a booby trap, you know, they might uh, miss it. And nothing was, like I say, 100% secure. I mean, even the mine sweepers can miss a mine or two or, or, a, or a booby trap. There were some more uh, tough incidents, too, where uh, Pamela, because he had a month to go. And and uh, for some reason, we don't know why he didn't, they didn't pull him out. But he went on the patrol, and he, uh, we heard the explosion and from up up ahead. And we said, what what happened? He said, uh, so-and-so stepped on the mine. And it was the platoon leader. I said, oh, my God. I said, he only had less than a month ago. And I, I I can recall feeling sorry, and I, I might have wept, I'm not sure, but I, I felt the pain that I, that he only had less than a month to go, and, I, and it hurt. It hurt just like the same way it, when I first, my first casualty, when that, that one uh, Marine stepped on the mine, he only had been in the country a, a few months, too, at that, and I said, no, I said, it started with uh, with this one guy going less than three months in the country, and then the guy going out with uh, less than a month ago. And it's it, uh, it's like at any time, it just it can be you, and you think you know, pray to God that it's not you. It was an operation, I think, and uh, we were down the road, and I was far back on the, on the road when I heard the explosion go off. We all we all felt for him because, like I said, we had a short time to go. We had to bond together and, and say, "Well, this is war." I said, "This is what's happening," and uh, and it's, it's, it wasn't easy to to accept his death. Uh, to me, it wasn't. No. There was uh, one incident where we were on the patrol, and. Uh, I think I was a point man, so we were walking down the uh, trail in the village, and at the corner of my eye, I, I could see uh, what we call them, Mama Son, Papa Son, standing in front of their hooch, which was their home, and then someone came from the back, and sure enough, it was the enemy, the VC. There was two of them, and I hollered out, VC. But I couldn't get my rifle. I, uh, the civilians were in the line of fire. So we went around the back in the hooch. And sure enough, those two guys were gone. And they, we, we looked at all the holes. There might have been any holes out there. But like I say, they hid well. We looked and we saw a hole. We fired into the hole and, and there was nothing. Uh, we'll be on patrols and sniper rounds to come in on us. And he didn't hit none of us. And, but that's another incident where you hit the ground so hard, you want to kind of dig your way into the ground so Charlie can't see you. But after a while, then I uh, they asked me to if I wanted to be the uh, M79 grenade launcher. I said, well, I said, well, what will my duties be? I said, well, you'll be in the center of the squad. I said, you'd be the grenade launcher. You'd be with the, the corpsman and the radio man and uh, whoever else is in the middle of the squad. And uh, your duties is to carry the M79 grenade launcher, which I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, you won't be carrying your rifle. You'll be carrying the grenade launcher and the forty five caliber. I said, okay, fine. I mean, I'll... I'm willing to do that. And uh, I got to know the my assignment, and my assignment was just clear whatever was up in front of us with, with uh, the grenade launcher, if there was any uh, contact with the enemy. And it, it served its purpose, because you can't throw a grenade, no 350 yards, that's for sure. And uh, But uh, having that and just pumping it to where they think the enemy's at, that's an advantage of a grenade launcher, M79. To me it was. But uh, you, you, only, you only carry so many rounds. One sash will carry the 
six rounds, six or eight rounds, and I had all those around my uh, my body. But when you carry a lot of them, they get heavy, and they're heavy. And, uh, and then also we had to carry uh, the uh, M60 uh, bandoliers for the uh, machine gunners too. I had to carry two bandoliers, and everybody else did too. But I remember uh, another time where uh, one stepped on the mine and it was a grenade that went off. He stepped on the on the hole and he it's got his foot and the b b grenade went off and blew off his foot. And I remember two ambushes that I was in. The one that st stays in my mind is the one where we were on an operation up in the mountains. And the uh, squad leader said that uh, we were going to set up an ambush. And at every 10 paces, one Marine would fall, fall, fall out. And uh, they wanted five of us to uh, set up uh, an ambush. So they, they would think the uh, VCs were there were watching us. They would see that we came out of the uh, mountains into the uh, rice paddies have them thinking that that's what we did. We set up the ambush and uh, we heard the noise coming down from the hills. And sure enough, there were about, I think, uh, four of them. One was a woman, too, at that. And next thing you know, we opened fire. And it's it's it was scary. But uh, that was my first incident, uh, my first encounter with the, with, the, with the enemy was that time when uh, we did that ambush. And then... The other ambush was uh, we went out early in the morning. I would say about uh, four o'clock, I guess, a.m. And uh, we set up up in the ridge and uh, overlooking the uh, the rice paddies. And we sat there for about uh, two, three hours, and we saw we saw them coming out because by day they worked the rice paddies, and by night they go up in the hills and get their weapons and. They they you know, and do what they have to do. They were the VCs, and we heard them coming out. And uh, as soon as we had clear uh, aim at them, we had uh, we opened up. And uh, at the time, I was a grenade launcher, and I pumped out how many rounds to where they were. And having killed anyone, I don't recall. But uh, we did take some uh, couple of prisoners, or one or two prisoners, and how uh, many. Uh, Viet Cong, did we kill? I don't recall because I didn't. It, it, I might have known at the time, but I, I can't remember if we did or not, though. And by then, I didn't have that fear. I remember just going on patrols, a lot of patrols, and that when you first arrive, you think you're ready. Physically, you try to be ready mentally, that's for sure. But physically, you go through all this training back in the States. And when you get up there, you're not really prepared because the temperature can be over 100 degrees, humidity high. Then you're carrying all that weight on you. And there were times where I was dragging and with all that weight and the heat and the humidity and the helmet and the flat jackets and what have you, and go up in those hills and those mountains, and oh, what you get used to, it, you get you get adjusted to the elements. That's, that's what it's all about, you know. You and there were some people that that couldn't cope with the uh, pressure and the and the stress, and mentally they weren't ready. Some of them, we could tell that they weren't ready, and we didn't want them. You don't want to show fear because the next your person next to you, your marine, counting on you. And uh, like, be ready to engage the enemy. Uh, Arizona, that is overlooking the hill, uh, the rice paddies. Arizona, and uh, we did a lot of walking on those rice, a lot. And there were times you walk the dikes, and sometimes you slip off and. They hit the rice paddies, and next thing you know, you, you may or may not get a leech on your on your on your leg. But uh, that was hard to walk on those rice paddies. It wasn't easy. It's 
it wasn't the dike wasn't meant to walk on. They were just separating some of the uh, boundaries to the the, uh, the rice paddies. But the rice paddies, they were mad. I didn't, I didn't like rocking the rice paddies at all. But you're in the brand new apartment. Because uh, uh, under to be on the side was the was the right was the rice and the all in water, and you're right in the open too with fire, and <laughs> I didn't care too much, but I, I really didn't. But that was some means ways to get back to the hill, and it was scary because you know you're right in the open, and Charlie can get his his uh, the snipers out there, but like I said, those they didn't have good snipers. I mean, to say. That was our, our main concern was to, uh, on Hill 52 was to, uh, we had to uh, go up in the mountains and uh, see if they were up there or, at first was, <laughs> was hell. And uh, when you have all that gear on your, on your back, there were times when you run out of water and it was rough. I mean, I just, like I said, at first when I got there, I couldn't, I couldn't bear the, Walking up or uh, hiking those the mountains up there, you, it, like I said, you you think you're physically ready and and you're not till you work your way into it. After a while, it's just a a walk in the park. There were times when I um, was in my foxhole or my bunker. I slept with my boots on, not because we ready to go, but the conditions. In the in the bunker, if it rained, it was muddy. It, if it was hot, it was hot in the bunker, and there were rats there too, and that's the one reason why I kept my boots on. This was an ongoing thing over and over, day in day out, twenty four seven. You know, it was hard to to really relax when you're tired, dead tired. You sometimes you. You don't care. You don't want. You just want to lie down and and sleep it off and, and say let this be over with. It it is stressful. It was stressful that uh, at times when when uh, nighttime came around and you were on whole watch, everything was quiet. But you you you're thinking. You're thinking. You try not to think about uh, how much longer you got to go and and. Uh, it's a it's a mind bogging thing, and I, I tried I tried not to think about it. Hope I make it for tomorrow for the next day, and I got here I am ten months, and people are calling me like people that just got to the to Vietnam. So oh, you're a short timer. I said you got four months to go. Yeah, but uh, four months was a lifetime. One day is a lifetime, and it's like something that uh, you try not to think about. It's it's uh, getting back home. Cause that can hurt the mind and hurt you to itself. So I try not to think about going, coming home. Just be thankful that I, I survived that one day and look forward for tomorrow and be thankful for that day too. I had the uh, in country R and R in China Beach. It was the three days of in country. You know, after six months they give you a time off the field. I enjoyed it very much so, but then the time came to go back to uh, reality and go back to the uh, my bunker and my whole watch and what have you. Then
like I said, not too much uh, contact till the uh, the final stage when my uh, at uh, Hill Twenty Five had just gotten overrun, and everything was an alert, red alert at the time that uh, they, they the, the Marines on Hill Fifty Two couldn't go to the rescue because the, they had us. Uh, ambush set up for the Hill 52 if they had anybody uh, going to back up the uh, Hill 25. So they just had to sit and watch and uh, and Lord and behold, my uh, drill instructor, Gunnar Bolton, he was uh, the platoon commander, I believe, at uh, on Hill 25. And I knew he was on that hill and uh, he made it through, and he lost some casualties too. He lost ten Marines, and uh, to this day, we we still have contact with each other. Uh, I'm in California, about maybe an hour and a half, two hour drive from here, and we we get together, we reminisce the uh, how it was, and uh, and he he remembered me when Hill Twenty Five got overrun. He came over, the well, they all did Hill Twenty Five, Hill Fifty Two. And he saw me, and <laughs> first word out of his mouth was uh, "bad squares." <laughs> that was uh, we addressed each other by our last names, and I was surprised he recognized me. I said, uh, "I said it wasn't no more yes sir, yes sir, no sir," because that was uh, the thing we had to do in boot camp. We had to respect uh, non commissioned officers as well as the uh, officers. That I remember being uh, seeing him at on Hill Fifty Two. And uh, that was in November of 67. And the last operation I was on was um, December 67. And Christmas, we were out there, uh, I think already two days, I'm not sure. It was a uh, full operation. And and this is when we encountered the, uh, the last uh, firefight that I was in. And it really was... A, a sight well, I never would picture in my mind I would be in a firefight going towards and having bullets coming at me at the same time. And what I can remember, we were uh, on the patrol. We might have been in some rice paddies where we uh, go oversee the the village. The, uh, and we caught, we caught uh, incoming rounds coming from the village. And we all hit the deck, and we had the word came down that we were going to do a frontal assault, which is get up and move forward, firing your weapon. And so they hollered frontal assault, and everybody got up and went forward. Here I am, not thinking about the fear, the adrenaline was there, and we went ahead and proceeded. But when you're doing it in real life, I mean, is is you don't stop and think, are they gonna hit me? They're gonna kill me. You know, I you I didn't stop and think that. I, it was just the encounter and the instinct just kicks in and you know what to do. To me it was just like a uh when I was there at being shot at I had I couldn't hear nothing on my right, nothing on my left. I was just going forward and like I was in another world. And it's that's the feeling I had. And we went maybe I don't know how many yards in, into the village or before the village and we ceased fire because the enemy had ceased fire too. I came through it but some did not and, and the ones that didn't, I like I say, I I I, I uh, feel for them. Uh it's a an incident where it's hard to describe that how you, how it is when you're getting shot at and you're going forward towards the uh, the enemy. It almost sounds like you're describing how the time to be scared is before or after. Yeah. But in the moment, you're just pumping with adrenaline. But yeah. So we uh, sat there, or we, we waited to what the next thing we were going to do, and I got the word that. Uh, the lieutenant wanted to see me. 
So I said, where is the lieutenant? So I said, Tell me, direct me to the lieutenant. And I see him from a distance, the lieutenant, the radio man, and uh, the core. I believe the corpsman was there too and someone else. And as I got closer, I heard the wire pop. And you go through this training over and over and over again, and you pop that wire, you you know what it sounds like, and you know what it is. But my instinct said, oh, it can't be. So I might have taken one or two steps forward, and as I maybe took that third step, the grenade went off. And next thing I remember, I was laying on the ground, couldn't move my legs. I thought I had lost my legs. Well, enough for, for well, the first thing that came to my mind was, am I dead? You know, how can you be dead if you're thinking? <laughs> and then I couldn't move my legs, and uh, and he's, and the corpsmen's came over, and and the, some other uh, marines came over, started. They took my pants off, and sure enough, I had multiple shrapnel wounds on both my legs and my foot and my some on my shoulder. And they told me that the corpsman got some shrapnel, and the lieutenant and Someone else, I don't know if it was the corpsman or not, uh, but uh, they were putting tourniquets on my on both my legs, and they called the medevac, and it was getting dark. And the medevac uh, chopper said, it's getting too dark, we may not be able to come down. I said, well, you have to come down because we got a man injured, and he may not make it to tomorrow because he's bleeding both, both his legs. And so, sure enough, they made it in, and they picked me up. And on the way out, uh, they were fire. We were, they were getting incoming rounds. The chopper was, and the chopper was. Uh, I could hear him firing that uh, fifty, uh, fifty-two caliber. And next day, I remember was I passed out. And then next day again, I woke up in the Da Nang Hospital. Next morning, I woke up, and they, I had an officer come up to me and he presented me the Purple Heart. And he told me that I was going back to the States. I was going back home. And I said, no, no, I, said, I don't want to go home. And you form a family and you, you're with these your fellow Marines, brothers, we call each other. And you don't want to leave them. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to go back, be there with my comrades, and be there for them as they were for me. I just wanted to, you know, be there. But they told me I couldn't because I had to uh, go back to the States. So that was Christmas Eve. And then to this day, that stays on my mind. Every Christmas he comes around, I, I try not to think about what uh, that that picture that just how it happened. That's the only thing I can have clear on my mind is the day I got hit. And anything else is just uh, there. But uh, that's my most uh, important thing that I, I do recall is my uh, the date, 12, 2467. So where did you go from the name? Uh, I went to uh, Travis Air Force Base, right on the bank to Travis, and from Travis I went to uh, San Diego. My boy, I went to my boy hospital, been there. I was there about uh, two and a half months, recovery and uh, rehab, and uh, then I got uh, stationed at uh, Edison Range. My last uh, six, six, seven months was at Edison Range. Yeah, I ran into Bolton in, in, uh, in uh, in the Edison range, he was. I was going back to my barracks, and I see him coming. He's a warrant officer, and right away I said the things and I saluted him. I said, "He said, Vasquez, say you made it home." Huh? I said, "Yes, sir." I said, "Made it home the, the on the stretcher, sir." I said, "I said, now we asked me uh, how did it happen, what happened." I explained to him what uh, what it was, and I asked him when did he leave. He told me what day he left and what have you. Then we talked for a while, and then we went our ways. And and it's uh, an experience that uh, that'll never go away. I'm living, I'm loving it. I'm thankful for God that I made it through. 
And I looked at the ones that received the Purple Heart, and but they're not here. And it hurts me to, to see that they are not here. And my heart goes out to them a lot. And it, it, it touches me a lot when I, when I think about that Purple Heart and I, 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 and I say to myself, I mean, why, 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 why? I mean, why, why do we have to go through all that? But it hurts, it hurts to see those, the ones that didn't make it. And I pray for them and I pray for their families. And it, it's a touchy thing. And it, uh, people don't stop and think, I said, oh, well, you went through it. I mean, they be glad that you're back. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm back, yeah, but I, I still have a feeling for the ones so we I left or we left behind. And that's the hurting part of, of knowing what the war is like.